Welcome to today's special alumni webcast, Preventing COVID-19. My name is Derek Kassoff, and I'm the Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. And greeting you live from the safety of my new home office, my basement. Checking in remotely as well are two of McGill's leading experts on infectious disease and population and global health. Dr. Marcel Baer is the co-director of the McGill Interdisciplinary Initiative in Infection and Immunity and interim director of McGill's Infectious Diseases Division. Welcome, Dr. Baer. Thank you, Derek, for having me. And we've got uh, Dr. Timothy Evans, inaugural director and associate dean of the School of Population and Global Health in the McGill's Faculty of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Thank Evans. Thanks, Derek, and thanks for having me back. Right, and thank you both for uh, taking time out of, I'm sure, what are very busy schedules. Um, so we've received well over 100 questions from alumni all over the world um, in the last 24 hours. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. We'd originally scheduled 45 minutes for this. Uh, both doctors have told me they are willing to stay on a little bit longer, um, if need be. So uh, we'll try not to take too much of your time, but we've got some wonderful questions that have come in. But before we get into them, I'm curious to know a little bit about how infectious disease experts and professors of global health, such as, your spell, such as, such as yourselves, um, spend your days uh, in the height of a pandemic. Um, Dr. Bear, what does a typical day look like for you these days? Um, well, thank you for asking. A typical day feels a little bit frenzied. I'm getting probably 10 times more emails, 10 times more texts, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of good questions, a lot of thoughtful questions. And um, a typical day like today, I started off and I put my phone aside so I could have 15 minutes to have a cup of coffee and relax. And during that time, my Fitbit rang two times and my phone was nowhere near me. So I had to hang up on my Fitbit. And by the time I went back to phone, the other person wasn't available. But that's mm -hmm. how it is. I managed to get to the hospital. I'm still working at the hospital because I'm the division director of a hospital unit and I'm trying to help as best as possible coordinate our hospital plans here and also try to help as much as possible make sure that all the people in my division have the resources and also occasionally some mental health breaks and just so that they get some moments away from all of this. Great. Well, I, our uh, hats go off to all of you in the healthcare system, of course, working double duty to try to get all of us through this. Uh, Dr. Evans, what about yourself? What, uh, what do your days look like now? Well, I only wish I could get as many emails as Marcel. Um, so, uh, but um, I know very busy. Um, I, I've been working with the uh, uh, Planning and Emergency Operations Committee at McGill University. And as you can imagine, the implications for uh, moving and complying with the government's recommendations with respect to uh, uh, these two weeks and, and most likely beyond March 30th are very, very important ones to think about how to manage. Uh, in addition, uh, because of my past in global health, um, I've been uh, interacting with the government of Canada and also many of our international partners, all of whom are um, doing their very best, I think, to figure out how, how to uh, respond to the evolving uh, situation. Um, I do have the benefit of working from home and I'm lucky to have my uh, family with me. So that's uh, uh, a little bit of a, of a dividend and we're doing well at the moment. Um, the biggest thing I have ch uh, troubles with is my own personal behavior. And I'm just gonna put up this little cartoon to show you uh, really what I've been dealing with. Um, and if you can see that, um, this is um, a picture of my <laughs> dog uh, telling me not to touch my face. Uh, and I have uh, borrowed um, the plastic container that uh, prevents my dog from putting its paws on its face um, so to uh, try and reinforce that. So uh, mm -hmm. the short message there is I'm trying to uh, walk the talk on the recommendations of behavior change, which are so important in, in managing uh, the epidemic and pandemic at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Well, for what it's worth, I've spent my entire life trying to get out of a horrible habit I have, which is being a nail biter. And within two weeks, I finally have long nails. So it didn't take much to get me to, to stop that habit. Um, so let's get, to, um, let's get into some of the conversation. Um, so sort of the frame this, Eight days ago, the World Health Organization came out and declared COVID-19, the COVID-19 outbreak to be a pandemic and said it was not a word to be used lightly. Uh, and it's hard to imagine how much our lives have been completely upended in the week or so since then. Uh, so we'll start with you, Dr. Evans. Why did the WHO make this declaration and what was its significance? 
So the reason they made the declaration is they had um, uh, definitive evidence of uh, community transmission in uh, a growing number of countries. And so uh, early on when it was felt that cases appearing in other countries were simply a function of people who had traveled from the initial epicenter in Wuhan or in some of the other countries, uh, there was uh, still some thought that uh, there would not be widespread community transmission of the virus in other countries. And uh, I think uh, uh, when we saw the announcement on the pan of the pandemic, uh, it was abundantly clear to everybody at that point uh, and has become even more clear since that we do have a pandemic, meaning we have um, uh, transmission uh, at community level in virtually every country of the world right now. So the significance is massive uh, because we are dealing with a, with a, a pandemic um, and every country and every individual in every country needs to be part of the solution. And I think this is um, the real clarion that there isn't any part of the world uh, that is um, uh, exempt from this. And therefore uh, we all have to rally together uh, and do as best as we can in an environment of uh, still, unfortunately, significant uncertainty. Great, thank you. And I think we'll uh, get to some of those specifics about what we can do to protect ourselves over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, Dr. Vera, we actually received, as you might imagine, uh, many questions from alumni uh, related to the science and the microbiology of this virus. Um, essentially, people wanna know in, in various forms, you know, what is the lifespan of the virus? How exactly is it attacking our bodies? And how is it able to replicate itself and spread so quickly compared to more traditional influenza viruses? So, so thank you, Derek. Um, so first off, the, the life cycle of this virus is probably similar to other respiratory viruses in that it comes into our eyes, our nose, or our mouth through activities such as nail biting, which you have blissfully stopped to do. And then it finds cells in our respiratory <laughs> mucosa where it enters and then it replicates. Viruses are not self-replicating like bacteria. They need to borrow our cells to live and to replicate. So they have to enter cells, they replicate, and then when there is shedding at a later point, and we have a current median incubation period in the three to five days or so when you are sick, then it comes out of those same secretions and goes to other people. The question is, uh, I think one of the part of the questions is why is this different than with traditional viruses like influenza? Currently, the estimates of what's called the R0 or the transmissibility or how many second infections are caused by first infection are generally on the order of two to three. And classically for a disease like influenza, the R0 was perhaps lower, perhaps closer to one. So that suggests that every case is causing more secondary cases. Now, what I don't know, and I'm not sure if other people know, but I would invite Tim to give his input, is whether this is because there's a higher viral load and people are shedding more virus, so you're more likely to transmit, or whether there is actually less pre-existing immunity so that everybody who is infected is more likely to get disease because this is a new virus and people are presumably not immune. So whether it's a pathogen determinant or a host determinant that is resulting in this higher are not is something that I think is currently uncertain. Tim, do you have any further thoughts on that? Uh, no, I would uh, agree that uh, we don't have definitive evidence on that, although a very interesting study from China just emerged this week, which suggested that uh, about 86% of the transmission of the infection uh, in China uh, during the epidemic, uh, the peak of the epidemic was likely to be due to people uh, who were uh, asymptomatic, um, so uh, not showing active signs of infection. So there is some suggestion, I think, uh, based on that, that um, this, uh, this um, virus uh, can transmit quite efficiently, uh, whether it's due to viral load or host um, uh, issues uh, related to lack of immunity, I think um, uh, we'll, we'll only answer that question when we have a test for it, um, whether or not people are showing antibodies to uh, the virus. Could I just follow up on Tim's point about the majority of transmission being from asymptomatic people? I'd like to suggest that before we think that everybody who is asymptomatic is therefore transmissible, 
we should remember that there is the per capita risk of transmitting and the per population risk. So on a per individual risk, if you are sick and you are sneezing and things are coming and you're crying and you're blowing your nose, clearly you are going to be shedding more virus than asymptomatic people. However, when there's a population of 4 million people, then the force of transmission from asymptomatic people will become more evident, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you both for, for that. Uh, Dr. Evans, on our first webcast on this subject over a month ago now, uh, back when we thought this was still, well, we knew it was still contained mainly to China at the time, um, you spoke a lot about the concerns you had that in this global interconnected world that we live in, uh, we're really only as strong as our weakest link. Um, and I'm sure that when you were thinking about countries that would be the weakest link, you were not thinking about places like Italy or the United States. So what does it tell you about this outbreak that even some of the world's most scientifically advanced nations have been unable to contain the virus and stop its spread? Were we simply unprepared? Uh, I think the short answer to that question is yes. And, and I think uh, we uh, underestimate uh, uh, the a shared risk that we all have with respect to global pathogens. Um, and uh, uh, I can't emphasize um, how important uh, it would have been uh, for all countries uh, to move much, much more quickly in uh, ramping up their preparedness and response. And the best manifestation of that is in testing. Uh, so if you look at South Korea, which has uh, done a very good job in managing uh, the outbreak, um, they are the country that has tested the most. Uh, they're up close to 300,000 tests. Their test rates per million population are uh, uh, climbing up over 5,000 per million. And if you compare that to Canada, uh, we're probably somewhere around 500 per million tests way under tested at the moment. So we can't uh, sit back and think we're doing particularly well. And if you compare that to places like the United States, um, they may be at 50 tests uh, per million at the moment. Uh, that's two orders of magnitude too low. Uh, there needs to be, as the Director General of the World Health Organization says, testing, testing, testing. Uh, I can't emphasize uh, how important that is <laughs> That's the best mark that you're understanding where those infections are, who the contacts are, and where you need to direct resources to get on top of it. So yes, um, uh, the weakest links are in the systems that um, uh, sometimes think that they're not going to get this as opposed to having great scientific might. If you're on your heels here, um, unfortunately, uh, you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baer? Hi, I'd just like to add that the interconnected world, which highlights our weakest point, is also highlighting some of our new strengths. And I've been incredibly impressed um, following on Twitter and other social media, some of the really tireless investigators who are putting out blogs, putting out ideas, sharing their thoughts, their insights, people who are putting viral genome sequences online, in order to infer whether there's multiple importations of the virus or to show that there's spread of the virus in Washington state. So there has been some, some major advantage of our interconnected world is that the dissemination of information and ideas has been quite remarkable. And I'd like to just give a shout out to some of the people who've been writing very influential ideas and op-eds on this. Mm -hmm. Now here in Quebec in particular, uh, the government has taken what appears to be a very, very aggressive actions moving to close down most public gathering spaces such as gyms, ski hills, movie theaters, uh, not to mention all the schools, um, and starting this when there were just a handful of confirmed cases in the province. Um, do you gentlemen think that this has been the right approach and one that other jurisdictions uh, should be looking to emulate? Tim, go ahead. Thanks, Marcel. Um, Derek, I, I think uh, uh, that in general, uh, the uh, policy of social distancing, uh, which is inherent in uh, these policies of shutting down big institutions and discouraging uh, gatherings uh, in large gatherings in places is, uh, is the right policy. 
Um, uh, so I think that uh, it, it, it is uh, the appropriate action at this point of time. Uh, it will be a difficult one to sustain. Um, and so we need to uh, be conscious of that. And I think we also need to be conscious of some of the real um, uh, differences that are taking place across countries in the implementation of this policy. Uh, in the UK and Australia, for example, uh, they haven't shut schools at this point in time. And uh, I think uh, this uh, will be interesting to see if in fact, uh, either that's uh, a strength in so far as those children um, um, uh, are not at risk or overly exposed uh, and perhaps develop herd immunity faster than they might if they were isolated um, and uh, whether or not uh, and uh, uh, we can manage looking at the consequences, perhaps the unintended consequences of keeping children at home, uh, which may put more stress on parents, more contact with grandparents, and therefore um, uh, adversely uh, increase the risk of transmission to uh, the elderly. So I think on the, my, in some, I think in general, the policy is the right one. I think there is some active and healthy discussion on, on what the, the risks and benefits are of um, uh, social isolation or social distancing for um, the youngest part of our population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to follow up with two two ideas there. And first off, I just want to uh, underline what Tim just said, is I think that universities are engines of thought and ideas. And I think it should be healthy to ask questions about this and to try to understand, while we all conceptually agree with social distancing, to what extent is social distancing helpful and to what extent will social distancing potentially lead to problems in some vulnerable populations. So there has to be an ongoing conversation. It would be nice to have a single answer, but I think universities were created as, as places where we can have these conversations in a civil tone. I'd also like to point out, just as a discrete example, you asked me what my day was like today. I went on Sherbrooke okay. Street here in Montreal, I got on a bus, and the bus was closed at the front, but the back door was open. The sign at the front was taped and it said you had to, for social distancing, stay away from the driver. So I got a free ride because I wasn't allowed to use my Opus Pass. And I thought this was a beautiful compromise that the infrastructure of the STM is there and it's available and it's helping people to move and the people who have to shop have to shop and the people who have to get to work have to get to work. While at the same time, I'm respecting the driver's need for space. And, and the driver need not fear that I'm going to be bringing a virus onto the bus and infecting that driver. So I think mm -hmm. for each situation, we have to try to find that delicate balance between providing the services and not um, amplifying the epidemic. Great, thank you. Well, even these in, in these opening remarks, you've answered many of the questions that have come in, but I'd like to actually get to some of the direct questions we did receive uh, from our alumni, from email and social media. I'll start with the, the first one. It comes in from Rafael Yanaz, and it's probably the one question that is top of mind for most people, which is how long should we expect to be in this period of social isolation? So I'll take it first, if you're okay, Tim. I think yeah. there's two questions about should we be in self-isolation, and that's the private question and then the societal question. The current recommendations, if you've traveled from abroad, you should be in self-isolation for 14 days, as is my wife and is my daughter. They came back from London last Saturday. They are staying at home. I get some of the outside duties. So as an individual level, please stay at home for 14 days. How long will the societal effort at social distancing be propagated or continued? That is something I do not know. And that's why I defer to Tim because he may have some better insights on that. Yeah, well, uh, thanks Marcel. I, um, um, I don't uh, I, I have the uh, crystal ball on that. I do think though, <laughs> as soon as we have uh, a test that shows whether or not uh, people are developing immunity to the virus, um, that that will help us understand uh, it, whether we can relax social isolation measures. So if we have a test which shows that many people are showing antibodies to uh, this virus, um, then uh, that uh, would suggest that we can um, begin to relax uh, some of the social isolation measures, particularly for the lower risk populations. 
so I think um, I don't want to put everything back to science, but I think uh, if there's a huge priority scientifically, it's to accelerate the development of a uh, of a blood test that would allow us to know whether somebody has developed antibodies to this virus. But to follow on that, Tim, I think we need not only a test, but we will need test results. And it's one thing to know that an individual is immune, but we will need to know what percent of society needs to be immune. And for that, we not only need to just be able to have the scientific capacity, but we'll also have to have the scale up that the test can be offered to large numbers of people. Absolutely. So too early, really, to put a time frame on uh, when we can go back to leaving our normal lives and back to work and school. Correct. Mm -hmm. So here's another question that's come in, um, probably not surprising, uh, from Tony Rybczynski. I was wondering if the virus will be less effective once we get warmer weather, and if so, why? So Marcel, I'm going to try first here. Um, I think there's, you know, there's reason to think when we see flu and colds, these seem to be winter phenomena in Canada. So there's reason to hope that this could be a winter problem that's less of a summer problem. If that's the case, then there's also reason to fear that it'll become a winter problem again next November. So I think we have to be cautious about using the warmth to relax things now if we're not ready to uh, ramp things up again in the fall. But we also have natural experiments where if you go onto some of the dashboards now and look at the number of cases in Canada and the number of cases in Australia, which is a country with a similar population, the number of cases is the same. And I would submit that most places in Australia have much more warm or hot weather today than we're experiencing in Montreal today. So I don't see any evidence from the natural global epidemiology that it's a cold, hot phenomena. If it is, maybe that's okay. But if it, if it is, we also have to remember that we will have another winter next winter. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the next question here, um, I'll try to pronounce uh, this name well, it's from Gazia Ozabachian. Uh, an excellent question. Um, what are the steps to take if one starts feeling symptoms? Who do we call and what do they actually do to help patients? Are people advised to stay at home to recover because hospitalization is not necessary or is it because there's not enough spaces and care left? So that sounds like a medical question. So I guess that's directed at the head of infectious diseases. I think the measures to take are largely the same as you would have done one month or one year or one decade ago if you got a cold. If you had a common cold and you felt miserable and you wanted to stay in your bed and have chicken soup, stay at home, stay in your bed and take chicken soup. If you are feeling too sick to manage at home or because you have a pre-existing disease and this is exacerbating your pre-existing disease, and one year ago, you would have gone to the hospital because you were too sick to stay at home. Right now, if you're too sick to stay at home, go to the hospital. That hasn't changed. I understand there's a fear of going to the hospital and acquiring infections and making things worse. But on the other hand, the general indications for hospitalization haven't changed, which is a hospital can offer you a level of care you cannot get in your home. So mm -hmm. if you are fortunate enough to get the care you need at home, stay at home. If it seems that you need oxygen because you're not able to breathe well, if it seems that you have completely uncontrolled fever and you're unable to function, those are the same reasons to go to the hospital. The hospitals now have in place testing for the virus, SARS-2-CoV, that causes the disease, COVID-19. So you will be asked questions when you enter the hospital. They will ask the screening questions. They will put you in separate rooms and they will do the testing that is necessary. But Fundamentally, the reasons to come to the hospital haven't changed. If you have any uncertainty about it, the Quebec government has put a 1877 number at the Government of Quebec website. I have not memorized it. I have it on my cell phone here. I'd have to look it up while talking. I'm not sure if I can, but you can certainly share it. And, and for the people listening from other jurisdictions, most governments have posted uh, toll-free appliances. Great. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Baer. Oh, Derek, go maybe ahead. Just, just to add on that is I think um, that many people feel if they have cold-like symptoms, then they should go and get tested. And I think what Marcel is saying, actually, if you have a cold, treat it like or cold symptoms, which could potentially be symptoms compatible with COVID infection. 
stay home if you're feeling well enough to stay home. And I think that um, also helps in terms of preserving uh, the social distancing and avoiding unnecessary exposure for people uh, who can stay at home. So I think uh, that side of it is, is, um, is particularly important because everybody has naturally a lot of anxiety that a cold symptom uh, may be an indication of um, COVID infection. I think in that point as well, when we look at the number of tests that are being done today um, in, in Canada, uh, that uh, of the at-risk population that are being tested, um, at 95 percent of those tests are negative. Uh, so the vast majority of people being tested for COVID at the moment are testing negative. Uh, it's a very small proportion and I say that mm -hmm. because um, the likelihood that if you do have symptoms of a cold uh, that they are a cold or a flu as opposed to COVID is still um, much higher than individuals having COVID. Mm -hmm. Great. And, so thank you to Tim to reinforcing that <clears throat> message. The counter side to if you have, you know, <clears throat> messages if you have a cold, stay at home. And the counter side to that is if you have sudden squeezing chest pain and you think you have a heart attack, go to the emergency because you think you have a heart attack. If you have the signs of a stroke that we've all been learned are the signs of a stroke, go to the emergency. The hospital is open. All the specialties. All the specialties are here, all the specialists are here. So please do not fear going to the hospital if you have a medical need to come to the hospital. We are here for you. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Erwin Fried uh, on a similar vein. Should you be tested if you think you may have come into contact with someone who has COVID-19? Uh, currently, we are not recommending testing people who think they were in contact with somebody. We are testing people for a variety of reasons. We're testing in Canada, we're testing in Quebec, we're testing symptomatic people. We're testing new admissions to the hospital, for instance. We do not have the scope to test everybody right now. Even people who have a cold who are at home and are not coming to us, we are not testing everybody who has a common cold. And going beyond that to the person next to them who doesn't have the common cold would really stretch our capacity for testing. So that is not recommended. Okay, here's a question from Toby Gilsig. Uh, we have read that the risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus is higher for those with compromised immune systems, as well as those with overactive immune systems. Should these individuals stop taking medications related to suppressing their immune systems? So, um, so thank you for that question. I, um, I was fortunate to be able to ask my colleague, Don Bin, who's an infectious disease specialist, whose expertise is the immune response to infectious diseases about that very question recently. And he wanted to reinforce that first of all, there's two steps of the question, is immune compromised a risk group? And one step is, are they more likely to get infected? And the other step is, if infected, are they more likely to have severe disease? At this point, Dr. Vin is unaware of any data speaking to either of those and several groups are working on it. And we also have to concede that immune compromise is what we call in medicine a heterogeneous group. There are people who are on a steroid inhaler for asthma and there's people who just had a bone marrow transplant for leukemia. And it's hard to put that completely varying group of patients into one group and call it the immune compromised group. There may be some groups that are higher risk than other groups and clinical researchers are trying to determine that. The second part of the question is if you have a heart transplant and you are living today because somebody gave through um, a bequest and through the autopsy process, a heart to you, so you are walking on the street, continue your anti-rejection medicines. Do not lose that heart now. This is not the time to stop the standard medicines that you need for your transplant, the standard medicines that you need for your lupus. There is no recommendation to withhold immune suppressive drugs and make your other conditions worse. Great, thank you. I've got one more medical question and then I've got a whole bunch for you, Dr. Evans, don't worry. Uh, but this one came out in a few different ways. Um, Kimberly Uhas uh, in particular was asking, is it safe to take ibuprofen and why are physicians in France saying otherwise? 
So my understanding is that um, there's an association between ibuprofen use and poor outcomes. What is unclear in the absence of what's called a clinical trial is whether there is something that's called confounding by indication, which is, did the ibuprofen make people worse or did the people who were doing worse take the ibuprofen? At this point, we don't know, but the association has been concerning enough that the WHO has pronounced against ibuprofen because in general, when you think of any medicine for any intervention, you have to ask, does the benefit in, uh, outweigh the risk? In the case of ibuprofen, there is no proven benefit. We have no way to quantify that ibuprofen use gets rid of the virus or ibuprofen risk use makes you better. So since there is no demonstrable benefit, it is quite prudent to say don't take it because there is a potential risk. But whether it's cause or consequence remains to be determined. I agree with the recommendation and our own hospital guidelines recommend against that class of medicines for a COVID case. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Kayla Gibbons. Uh, Dr. Evans, maybe uh, I'll let you jump in on this one. Um, for those who are self-isolating and taking all the necessary precautions to avoid the spread of the virus, but whose husbands or wives are still working and coming home to their families who have been self-isolating, how can we make our own homes a safe place? So I think, I, I think uh, this is um, uh, challenging in some respects uh, in, in terms of uh, what the conditions are of a particular home. Um, and that of course will vary. Uh, but I think uh, first and foremost is to uh, really reemphasize good um, personal infection hygiene. Uh, and that relates to washing hands, uh, uh, avoid touching the face, um, uh, which is a very efficient transmission of a virus, um, uh, sneezing and coughing appropriately into elbows or Kleenexes, um, and keeping surfaces clean. Um, if uh, there's opportunity, if the household has multiple uh, facilities, bathrooms, then there may be a way that um, uh, the individual who is self-isolating can use one of the bathrooms or one of the bedrooms um, uh, without uh, others having to use it. So there may be, depending on circumstances, opportunities for houses to accommodate a little bit more um, a dedicated use of some parts of the house uh, for the individual that's self-isolating. And if that is the situation, uh, then um, uh, it certainly makes sense uh, to do that. Um, so I think uh, those would be my suggestions on, on that front. Uh, of course, anybody who is living with somebody who is um, self-isolating uh, has to, of course, um, uh, uh, monitor their own uh, symptoms and, and should they develop symptoms and they should also report those. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions have come in, as you might imagine, about transmission um, and whether the virus remains airborne and for how long. I want to get to a specific one. It's quite specific, but I think many people have this similar anxiety. It comes from Sharon Brandt, uh, who says she lives in a modern condo in downtown Toronto uh, and is wondering if she should turn off the air conditioning, heater or blower in her unit. Will the virus travel into her apartment via the air that way? So, so currently there's no evidence that viruses are traveling from one room to the other. There are infectious diseases like tuberculosis where it has been shown in the past that if you take the air from a patient room with tuberculosis and then bring that air into another room, the guinea pigs can get sick. And that's what's called aerosol transmission. In the case of coronaviruses and most respiratory tract infections, the primary route of transmission is what's called droplet transmission. You sneeze, you cough, something comes out uh, and hits somebody's face or eye or whatever. That's the primary route of transmission. We are talking in the hospital about what are called aerosol generating procedures. So an aerosol generating procedure is when somebody is very sick and they need to be intubated. And at the time of intubation, they may gag and there may be suction. And then you can imagine where there will be kind of a cloud of virus floating around them for a short period of time. But with time, it will settle and it will land on the ground or land on the table. And that's the surfaces that we have to clean. It will not fly out into the air and out the ducts in the top of the room and then transmit to the next rooms. So my advice to somebody who is in a closed condo right now 
is if the weather is nice, open the windows and enjoy a stream of air from outside. And if you have a chance, go outside and go to the nearest park and enjoy the beautiful weather. There's, I, I see there's a lot of very good spirit of people seeing each other in the park and talking to each other and keeping distance. So I wouldn't stay in the condo, but I wouldn't turn off the heat either. Great. Uh, a, a similar question from Beverly Berenbrom. Uh, was wondering, do we know how long the virus lasts on inanimate objects? Uh, for example, when we're buying groceries, do we have to worry about bringing them into our homes? Um, there are, of course, studies looking at how long the virus lasts on plastic or glass or copper or cardboard. And I'm not going to pretend I know the exact number for every surface. I think the more pragmatic question is if I go to the grocery store and I come home, do I have to disinfect the outside of every Cheerios box? And the answer is go to the grocery store, wash your hands, take things out, wash your hands again, and use good hygiene. And remember that when you're preparing your meal, you should use all the good hygiene for all of the things in there. If you're going to be handling eggs, this is a time to remind yourself to wash your hands after cracking an egg. This is the time to make sure that you don't use the same breadboard for the chicken as you use for the salad, because this isn't the only microbe that we are encountering and common sense and hand washing will help you to reduce your risk of many different microbial exposures. Mm -hmm. I've actually been thinking a bit about that and, and you know, one day hopefully soon we will be out of this and beyond this. Um, is this, do you guys think that this is gonna change the way we actually think about personal hygiene forever? Will we be the generation that will never have to be told again to wash your hands and not touch your face? <laughs> Tim, Dr. Evans, do you want to take that one? I, listen, um, as somebody who's uh, suffering from short-term memory deficits increasingly, um, uh, I'm quite sure that we'll have to reinforce these messages continually and over time. Uh, I think you're pointing, Derek, to I think one of the benefits uh, is that if we can exercise better infection hygiene, um, then we may not only uh, uh, slow the progression of COVID-19, but we may also limit transmission of other uh, pathogens that uh, Marcel deals with all the time, some of which uh, have patients ending up in the hospital, uh, like salmonella and things. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the, what we say in economics, the positive externality, the benefit of this goes far beyond COVID and um, I think it is right. Uh, there will be some lasting effect, but we will have to continually reinforce um, these sorts of behaviors just because um, uh, they often get forgotten uh, um, two or three years after the, or you know, some period of time after the uh, scare. So uh, I, I think uh, it's the right direction, but I, I can't imagine that uh, we're gonna put public health officials uh, out of work uh, in terms of infection hygiene. Great. So on that note, I, I did want to maybe, oh, sorry, go ahead. Hey, Dr. I'd just like to point out that one of the great things about my job is I learn something new every day and I just learned about positive exponentiality. So thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> great. But I do want to actually maybe use this. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit uh, about the situation uh, or the solutions being developed in some of the Asian countries. And when the WHO had their press conference last week, uh, announcing this to be a pandemic. They did, in fact, single out China and South Korea for praise for taking steps to slow down the spread. Uh, I read in certain media reports that part of that is cultural because these are countries that have experienced uh, serious outbreaks in the past, uh, whether it be SARS or, or avian bird flu. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit to us, Dr. Evans, about what exactly is happening in, in these countries, specifically <laughs> China, Singapore, South Korea, uh, that the rest of the world might want to take some lessons from? Um, and are we as, you know, uh, citizens of liberal democracies in the West willing to go so far as to abide by some of these measures? Yeah, so great question. And, and Derek, let me first state that um, a, a number of the countries that you refer to are liberal democracies. Um, and, and so I think uh, it's very important uh, to recognize that uh, um, there are a number of countries outside of China, including Singapore, South Korea, Thailand, where you have uh, active democracies that uh, are, are certainly very different from the political system in China. However, more fundamentally, if you look at what's being done, uh, there is a tremendous amount to learn. And, and as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I believe if you have to put a, 
uh, country up on, up, up on a pedestal at the moment, uh, not to jinx them, but to simply say uh, their experience has a lot uh, that the rest of the world can learn from, and that's beyond China. Uh, it is South Korea. And uh, if you look at the extent to which they have been on top of testing uh, since early February, and the way, the way in which they've ramped that up, um, it is uh, absolutely, um, uh, I think, the way to go. And I can't stress that enough because uh, in our own country, I think we still are not scaling up uh, our testing. And uh, I've communicated this to various government officials, but um, I think we need to uh, move it up at least another log order tenfold in order to get on top of this. Um, so that's number one lesson. Number two, uh, you have different experiences with respect to lockdown. Um, China, it seems as if it was uh, quite important and effective. Uh, the Korean Minister of Health said that lockdown actually created more problems than it was worth uh, because people, uh, uh, pe because of issues related to compliance and people knowing the lockdown came, was coming would, would move and, and that created problems with getting compliance with testing. So I think that sort of experience is, um, it, it is extremely important. The third is how to think about managing the surge that will be felt on um, uh, your hospital infrastructure. And we know everywhere uh, that there is likely going to be a, a very steep increase in need for hospitalization and in particularly intensive care um, with ventilators. Uh, I think the experience of China, South Korea uh, in accelerating expansion of that infrastructure and the human resources to deal with that uh, has a tremendous amount uh, for us to learn from. So I think those are, are, are lessons that are not conditional on politics uh, other than political will. And I think what we're seeing is our leaders are, are stepping up, uh, but what we really need to see is tangible, clear plans uh, on testing um, and in particular on supporting uh, the surge capacity for hospital care um, in order to uh, secure public confidence that we're actually doing everything that we can to, to manage this uh, pandemic. I'd like to just add that I think there's many natural experiments going on in the world and it's there's a risk of oversimplifying and saying China is doing well because they are communist or Italy is doing well because people kiss each other on the cheek twice. And, and there are so many different countries and there are so many different factors between healthcare systems and social norms. And I think we should definitely, you know, we should be very prudent about just comparing two and saying it's because of one leader or one country. And we have to think through all of the possible facets and then we have to convert the possible facets into actionable intelligence. And as Tim says, one of the things that seems to transcend all boundaries and borders and political parties is that testing is good and more testing is better. Mm -hmm. Could I, Derek, just to come in and not to, to continue on this, but I do think also the reporting on testing is particularly important. And then just drawing on Marcel's suggestion of learning from other countries, if you go to the UK Department of Health website, uh, they report uh, on the epidemic uh, every day by starting saying this number of people have been tested, this number of people tested positive, this number tested negative. And if you look at that, and if the media started uh, reporting on the numbers tested, and in particular, the numbers testing negative, then it would change perceptions that everybody, every new case means that everybody is getting infected. And I think this is the sort of communication that would help manage ex, uh, perspective, um, both with politicians, but also with the public. Uh, and I think these sorts of data are real data and very helpful in putting risk in better perspective. So I do think uh, there's an opportunity to learn from better practices on reporting, which are not only what government reports, but how the media picks that up and also reports it. 
I, well, I appreciate that, Dr. Evans, but I'm just wondering, uh, while I appreciate the reassurance that some of these test results might provide us, is it not a bad thing that the population is a bit scared right now and therefore more abiding of social distancing and other measures? I think um, uh, you're, I don't think there's any issue here with respect to the extent to which uh, people are aware that this is a serious threat. And uh, I think by putting things into perspective, it's not to suggest somehow that we're not dealing with a very serious problem. Uh, but it does, I think, uh, uh, behoove us uh, not to paint everything as an Armageddon scenario, when in fact the data don't support it. And I think mm -hmm. it's a responsibility uh, for good governance uh, to present the data uh, as they are or as best as we understand them. So I think uh, that's a difference. It's not to suggest uh, telling people the truth is a uh, uh, is, uh, is the same as saying, don't be concerned. It, we're simply suggesting, tell us the situation really as it is, uh, and then uh, continue on. No one is suggesting that we're gonna back off on any of the uh, measures that we're taking with respect to social distancing and uh, active testing and getting people into care as appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, so being cognizant of time, and I appreciate the fact that you're both willing to stay on maybe a few more minutes. I do have a few more scientific questions. Maybe I'll turn to you, Dr. Bear. Maybe we can do some quick rapid fire here and try to get through a few of these. Uh, a question from Erica. Can the coronavirus get into our water and survive? Um, if I understand, the question is about our drinking water and not going canoeing or swimming in the water in Canada right now. And there's no evidence that it is transmitted through our water supplies. Okay. What about um, somebody, Janet Bach actually was asking about, with the fact that our libraries are closed, uh, and people are considering sharing books and DVDs and magazines with each other. Is it overreacting to think that doing this could be dangerous? It's not a, a complete overreaction because we're being told to wash our hands and try to keep things clean. If you are in the house with somebody and you're sharing a DVD, that I think is reasonable. But we actually also have many options to get ebooks and to download things so that if you don't want to go across town to meet somebody to pick up a magazine, see if this is the time that you should consider getting an electronic subscription. It's the same content, it's just you don't get to turn the pages. Mm -hmm. Question from Nicholas Matosian. Should we be wearing masks even though they are deemed to be only partially effective? Well, the, the, that's sort of two questions. And the one question is, are masks partially effective? And I guess that question depends on effective at what and for what. But I think the main question there is, should a healthy asymptomatic person who is well going to the park wear a mask? And I say the answer is no. When I walk to work, I don't wear a mask. When I walk home, I don't wear a mask. Should healthcare workers wear a mask if they go into a room with somebody who has COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19? Yes. What mask should they wear? They should wear the mask that their infection control officers have deemed necessary depending on the severity of the illness and the procedures going on. There are clear directives in the healthcare system about when to wear a mask and who to wear a mask. But people who are walking to the park and back, that is not one of the reasons to wear a mask. Okay, I've got two more quick ones here. One from Nathaniel Brand, uh, asking about the potential impact of COVID-19 on pregnant women. Are there any extra steps you would recommend they take to protect themselves? I am unaware of uh, an association between COVID-19 and adverse effects in the woman, nor I am unaware of any uh, data on COVID-19 and adverse effects on the fetus. I am sure that these data will be accruing with time, um, the outbreak started around early November, according to the genomic epidemiology data. So in terms of birth outcomes, we would not have passed nine months. So we will have to wait until nine, November plus nine months. Uh, Tim can do that faster than me. I'm going to guess that's August 1. Um, but I don't think we know the answer on either of those. It's a good question for which I think the data are still waiting. Mm -hmm. And we cannot do uh, an entire webcast without talking about our pets. Uh, Tim Sellers was asking, uh, he says he's been practicing social distancing and walking his dog to the park. Uh, I stay away from the other dog walkers, but my dog plays with other dogs. Is this a potential problem? 
There is no evidence that dogs are spreading coronavirus to their owners. And I am also unaware of any evidence that cats are spreading coronavirus to their owners. I have seen firsthand that when dogs go to the dog run, they do not do social distancing and they do all kinds of things that we would normally think would be really good at spreading all kinds of microbes. Um, but we're not aware that that's going to change with COVID-19, nor am I aware that the dogs are actually going to follow our guidelines. I think we have to let our dogs play. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Evans, uh, I want to ask you a bit about vaccines. I know we spoke a little bit mm -hmm. this, about this on our last webcast. Yep. Um, do you have any update or any news on when the world might see a vaccine? Uh, uh, well, I think that's, um, um, it depends who you ask, but uh, the, 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 um, I think what I'm hearing is that the earliest would be within a year to 18 months. Uh, and that would be the very earliest. Um, there are some uh, vaccines that are now in what we call phase one clinical trials, and uh, we're seeing uh, more and more candidates, but the, the, the phase one needs to go to phase two, phase three. So there's a distance um, and not all candidates in phase one make it through uh, uh, with uh, evidence that they um, actually have the potential to be an effective vaccine. So um, my understanding, and Marcel may have more to add on this, but that the various, very earliest we'd see a vaccine is uh, one year to 18 months. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I think, if all goes well with the current candidates that are into testing, um, uh, it may well take longer. As we've seen in the context of HIV, um, we've been looking for a vaccine since, um, well, well over 20 years, and, uh, and we still haven't got a vaccine for uh, HIV. So not to take away hope uh, and not to take away any uh, of the importance of investing in trying to accelerate the development of vaccines as we have through something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, CEPI, uh, but uh, it may be longer than a year to 18 months. So from my vantage, if you're creating a new product, whether it's a new vaccine or a new treatment, there is a, a due process that involves preclinical testing, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. And that takes time in order for everything to be done correctly. If you have a product that's already FDA approved for a completely different indication, then you can fast track and do something called like an off target or off label study. And that's what some of the trials that are in the New England Journal are at looking at drugs that were developed for something else and whether they could work for COVID. The same principle could in theory apply if other vaccines that are already going into people happen to have some off-target effect against COVID. I'm aware of people talking about that and, and looking at whether there are ways to investigate that, but I am unaware of something that is an, an already licensed vaccine that has activity against COVID, but that is the fastest route I can imagine to a COVID vaccine, although that's a very exploratory idea right now. Mm -hmm. We did get one question, which I would like to mention here from Alexandra Tsitouris who's asking if there's actually a need for volunteers to either help with the important research or to help with any of the testing. So that question is, is well received. I have heard, I've had a contact from um, professors at McGill who were trained as doctors in another country who have volunteered to put on their white coats and stethoscopes and come and step in and help in the clinic in any way possible. I have had contact in emails from students who are in research labs or who have been in research labs offering to volunteer and help with diagnostic testing in the microbiology labs. We don't yet have a place for that, but we already are starting to see, for instance, that our, um, some of the people who um, have trained and retired are signing up to come back into the ranks of the workforce. And we have people who have the license but are doing extra training who have signed up during the period of extra training to come back and help with, for instance, COVID clinics. So we're starting to see that our workforce is increasing as people who have left the workforce are coming back and are volunteering. And the next level may be that we will ask for volunteers to also support them as we grow. For uh, now, our workforce is good. 
And curiously, because of the, um, the reason that nobody is traveling, everybody is in town, nobody is overseas, nobody is at meetings, so we are okay now. But as Tim has alluded to before, we're probably just before the surge. And what our capacity is when the surge hits remains uh, undetermined right now. Uh, Eric, let me just, just uh, add a few things to Marcel's uh, great response. Um, and that relates to uh, uh, one uh, for everybody who's in, who has uh, their health uh, and has expertise in one domain or the other. It's really important now to think about how you can be part of the solution. Right. And uh, I think it's a mistake to assume that existing structures, governmental or hospital or public health, have all the resources they need. The grim reality is they don't. And so just uh, as an example, my discussions with the government of Canada, um, they're very receptive uh, to the idea that uh, we, you know, we've got a great epidemiology unit at McGill. Uh, they'd love to have uh, two or three of our best epidemiologists to help them strengthen the daily reporting on the epidemic. Um, and, and if we can do that, we would love to do it. Um, managing supply chain for all of the different parts of the diagnostics that are needed, the nasopharyngeal swabs, the transport media, uh, the reagents, uh, those are things that require innovative uh, solutions in, um, in the current context and might benefit from entrepreneurs who understand how to source um, these sorts of commodities quickly and efficiently and at scale and aren't necessarily the sorts of things um, and experience that some of the desk officers who are responsible for that um, have experience with. So I think uh, the intent of that question is, is, is absolutely the right spirit. Um, let's see how you in your own experience and expertise uh, it can play some positive role to strengthening the response. Uh, and I think if we do that collectively, uh, that's going to uh, make a significant difference in managing and responding to the current situation. Now, that would be a great uh, question to perhaps end on, but I do have to ask you um, this next one. I know the answer. I'm hoping you can each answer in one word, but it's such a great question from Peter Lippmann. Is there any rational explanation for the apparently overwhelming obsession with toilet paper? No. <laughs> Dr. Evans? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me ask actually one final question. I have one of my own, which I'm <laughs> hoping to maybe end on, on some, some, some good hope. Um, but as you know, we're hit every day with an onslaught of grim statistics uh, and bar graphs. Is there any one data point we should be looking out for either in our local communities or at a global level that would give us all a sense of hope or relief that the spread is in fact slowing down and we're nearing the end of this nightmare? So from my view, I, I coming back to what Tim said before, the number of tests, the number of tests positive, I don't know what the percent positive means from Canada to Germany to Korea if I don't know who is getting tested. So I would not use the percent positive test. The number of tests could be useful or not, but as you roll out more testing, the number of positives goes up. So I'm not sure if that's the one. So my grim answer, sadly, when I look at dashboards and I look at Italy versus Germany versus China versus South Korea, I'm looking at deaths. I know it's a very sad statistic. There was a fantastic YouTube video looking at the obituary pages in the Bergamo a newspaper in Italy showing that the obituaries went from one and a half pages to 10 pages. And if I see that the number of deaths goes down today, then I can be optimistic that the number of transmissions went down 14 to 21 days ago. I know it's a sad statistic, but that's a hard statistic and it's a very meaningful statistic. Um, so that's the one that I'm currently tracking. Great. Uh so as, as somebody who's uh, uh, a little bit more optimistic um, uh, and is uh, obsessed with, tr with tracking uh, the imperfect data on, on, on uh, numbers tested and numbers testing positive, um, I think the important statistic to look at is the numbers testing negative. And if that 
uh, uh, continues, uh, if that trend is trending downward, uh, then I think um, recognizing that most of the people that are being tested are high risk, uh, then that is a sign that I think will lead uh, 14 to 21 days later to a, a much more definitive sign of, of, of progress, which is decreased deaths. But um, uh, you can certainly see that trend in, in, in South Korea. Uh, and I think if people recognize that we're talking about uh, 90 uh, or 95 percent of people testing negative going down, going up to 96 to 97, 98, uh, those are indications not only that we're moving in the right direction, but still the majority of people are not getting COVID-19. Great. Well, hopefully that day is not far away for many of us in the world. Uh, so we are at the top of the hour, and that about wraps up the time we do have uh, today, time and over time. Uh, before we sign off, I would like to remind uh, everyone that this video will be available at this same link uh, very soon after our recording ends. So feel free to watch it again if you'd like, uh, or share it with others who may not have been able to tune in in real time. Um, I'd also like to invite you to keep an eye out for more emails from McGill. Uh, I promise you there will be fewer than you're used to, uh, but we are committed to providing our community with the news and information you need to stay safe and to stay informed, including more webcasts with our academic experts. And finally, I would like to extend a sincere thank you to Dr. Evans and to Dr. Baer for joining us today um, and for sharing some incredible insights with all of us. I know your schedules are, are quite packed and we really appreciate the time you took um, out of your days to speak with us today. Um, and I hope we'll have a chance to connect again soon. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Marcel. Take care. Thank you.